Thanks for that warm introduction, and thank you all for being here. It's great to see so many familiar faces. I was especially pleased to see Kevin Kim, um, who um, interned with us, um, and Arkansan, who interned with us at the Southern Feedways Alliance a couple of years back and did, speaking of oral histories, did oral histories with Chinese grocers um, in the Arkansas Delta and the Mississippi Delta. So it's great to have him with us tonight, and it's great to be with y'all. Um, I'm going to do a couple of things over the course of the next 45 minutes. Um, uh, primary among them, kind of explain myself and, and my approach to food, and that was a wonderful setup for that, and um, explain the Southern Foodways Alliance in part and what the Southern Foodways Alliance attempts to do, and then show you a couple of films, um, one focused on Mississippi, where I live and work, and the other focused on Arkansas, um, or at least on Arkansans who work a middle ground or middle water between Arkansas and Mississippi. Um, I had a really good day before I saw y'all. I went wandering around with this woman's um, husband um, and um, went to the root and had a great lunch, had a great um, grass-fed burger. Um, I went to Rocktown Distillery and tasted some gin, some smoked weeded whiskey, um, went to Ham, um, the butcher shop, and ogled some bison jerky, um, and uh, also bought myself some basmati rice, um, brown basmati rice from here in Arkansas, and then in the lobby of the, of the Capitol Hotel, um, ogled or ogled, I always mispronounce that, I don't know which it is, um, the menu at Ashley's where I look forward to dining later tonight. Um, just before I joined you though, I broke my glasses um, and snapped them right here on the bridge. So if they happen to fall back apart, I can't see, I, I'm serious. So I'm nominating you, Anne, to come up and pick up these notes and continue my talk. Um, one of the virtues of staying in a great hotel like the Capitol is you call downstairs and you say, I just broke my glasses. And they say, we've got super glue. Um, so it's all that to say, it's great to be here. I'm glad also to follow in the wake of friends, Alan Shia, who was here, I guess, last week, um, talking about the rebuild of New Orleans post-Katrina. Um, in which Louise Terzia, who is here um, somewhere out there, was um, a strong and um, quite important volunteer in that effort of building Willie, rebuilding Willie Mays Scotch House, a great fried chicken restaurant. Um, and my friend Tucker Carrington was here from the University of Mississippi's Innocence Project, too. Um, so I'll cease with the preamble and, and tell you a story. So I was in Charleston back in March, and it's a great city for eating, as you all well know. Um, during my time there, I had a, new, a number of conversations with my friend Sean Brock, and Sean is kind of the chef of the moment in the South. You know, there was a profile by Burkhard Bilger in The New Yorker with Sean. Um, Charlie Rose interviewed Sean for about 20 minutes on his show. Um, and Sean and I have had the same kind of conversation through the years, and it's something like this. Um, Sean says, you know, I talk to other chefs from other parts of the country, and they're jealous of what we have in the South, Sean told me. They're jealous of our ingredients. They're jealous of our whiskey. They want our ham, Sean told me, and they want our history. Um, he was quite eloquent in, in his kind of explanation of one chef among many in this nation all trying to figure out American regional culinary culture, um, as Lee Richardson does so well at Ashley's. Um, it made me think that, you know, America wants a lot out of Southern food. When Americans go in search of a snootful, they reach for bourbon, Kentucky's native spirit. When they want diversion and abandon, they travel to New Orleans, our papal city of food and drink, where brackish gumbos bob with crab and sausage and Sazerac's brim with rye and bitters. A meal of pork neck bones and collard greens served in a center block diner on Atlanta's Sweet Auburn Avenue offers soul food passage to urban African American life in an age when molecular cuisine is vanguard, North Carolina whole hog, barbecue offers primal and delicious answer to pilgrims in search of honesty and authenticity. 
As a nation urbanizes, as strip malls and cul-de-sacs and other nowhere is spread, the South plays across the pages of newspapers and magazines as the region where agriculture is still a way of life and food carries the weight of history. In the midst of what I've come to think of as kind of a, an American nostalgia movement, the South seems to be the place to discover the past and the present, to make good on the claim of an Atlantic Monthly contributor who called turn of the 20th century Appalachian men and women our nation's contemporary ancestors. I thought that was a great turn of phrase, this idea that people come south for looking, looking for the past and the present. They come looking for some unvarnished, honest America. Um, and I think they look for a lot of that in our food as well. You know, through my writing and through my work at the Southern Foodways Alliance, the hope is, the plan is, um, the attempt is to kind of turn a mirror on the region and show how black and white Southerners, complicit in a long and tortured history, learn to take pride in their shared creations. So those things that we created together, black, white, rich, poor, um, that are reflections of people in place, reflections um, of who we are, you know, that's music, right? It's literature that are shared creations. Religion, we forged our own. And yes, I think of food as a cultural totem of the South. In the American South, dishes like fried chicken and barbecue, cornbread and collards serve as totems of identity. Yes, they provide sustenance, but a love of those foods also unifies a geographically and ethnically diverse region, comparable in size to Western Europe. From the 1890s, when Atlanta newspaperman Henry Grady told the North, sold the North on a new South, to the present, when every other chef and writer in New York City seems to take a summer road trip through the region in search of what makes Allen Benton's hickory smoked Tennessee bacon so darn good, Southern food is reflected both on the ground realities and in the clouds fictions. That's what symbols do. They serve as vessels for the stories we tell about ourselves. In that century plus period that I mentioned from Grady until you know, now, um, in that century plus period, Southerners told a lot of food stories. Most have been about what stayed the same, which would be, say, our Southern supremacy as fried chicken cooks. But much during those same years has changed about the South. Now, in this moment, Hispanic restaurant cooks now outnumber African American cooks in the South. Through the decades, Southern food, to my mind, resonates. Food here carries burdens. It reflects the region, it reflects the people who call this place home, whether they have five generations of roots in this soil or whether they've just arrived. My son, who's now 11, um, you know, I grew up small boys, young boys, like sweet things, at least I did, sweet drinks especially. I grew up drinking sweet tea, um, Mountain Dew. Um, I craved the caffeine kick and I craved the sugar. And that was, those were my drinks as a boy. My son, who's 11, if you ask him what his favorite drink is, any ideas what he might say? Orchata. Y'all know Orchata? This is, you know, this is, this is a taco stop food. This is the foods of Mexican, the drink of Mexican immigrants. This is a rice water drink flavored with cinnamon. That's my son, age 11, as pasty white as me. Um, that's my son's favorite drink. And that reflects to me the modern South. It reflects a South that I embrace and love. And I think it also reflects how we can understand others through food, through what they eat, through what they drink. This drink is my son's, you know, my 11 year old son. It's his totem of place. Orchata is what he drank as a boy and what he'll tell his, his son about through the years. So to that point, Southern culture is never static. You know, there's this idea of talking about, I gotta be careful, um, about the South as if it was fixed in some time past. But the South isn't fixed in some time past. This didn't fix, the South hadn't fixed in 1865, or 1965 for that matter. Southern culture evolves, and so, by extension, so does Southern culinary culture. So to understand how lines of race and class and gender 
have formed and broken and reformed over the last century, I, along with my colleagues at the Southern Foodways Alliance, explore food. To understand how Southern identity has been honed and to track the ways that foods like barbecue and fried chicken have served as symbols in a region where, let's be honest, symbols have been especially problematic. Um, I sketch stories about growing, cooking, serving, and eating food. I think these stories sketch truths about our region and its peoples. Now, I'm a native of Georgia. Um, I was born in the home of a Confederate general. I began grade school during the last days of the Civil Rights Movement. Um, I now make my home in Mississippi, the state that birthed novelist William Faulkner and farmer and activist Fannie Lou Hamer. My son plays in the same pasture where Faulkner played as a boy. Soon after I arrived in Oxford, um, I thought I, the work that I would do would be on race relations. Um, I didn't suspect that the work I would do would bring me to write a book called The Truck Food Cookbook. Um, I love my region really deeply. I have learned, however, to balance that love with, tw with tough questions about our past and our present and our future. Now, I went back to school, as was mentioned in the kind introduction, I went back to school about 10 years after I should have gotten out of college. Um, and uh, what I wanted to do at that point was to work my way through my conflicted ideas about my place, about the idea that I love this place I'm from, and you know, on a bad day, I loathe this place I'm from, if you're paying attention. I believe that a turn in graduate school at the Center for the Study of Southern Culture at the University of Mississippi um, would set me straight, that my tact then was to study race relations, and my plan was to make a difference in the region. But after trying a number of approaches, I settled on food as my way in. I learned that food offers me entree to talking about those big picture issues like race, class, gender, and justice. When I address those matters head on, I sometimes lost an audience. But at a table piled high with country ham and butter biscuits and red eye gravy, people leaned in close. So I learned a lesson there and have spent the last 15 years working with the Southern Foodways Alliance and through my own writing to use food as a way of thinking about those bigger issues. Um, along the way, I've sipped iced tea with a former Klansman and present day civil rights leaders. I've eaten cheeseburgers and fried okra with an Elvis impersonator. I've talked harvest techniques with a black man who owns 100 acres of land in North Carolina and has owned those 100 acres for 100 years. I talked with him about converting his crop from burly tobacco to organic collards. I've talked to animal husbandry with a man in Alabama um, who tried to convince the rest of the region in the 1970s that possum was the next other white meat. <laughs> he was a good salesman. Tonight, I'm going to show you a couple of the stories that I find compelling. Um, both of these films were made by my colleague, Joe York, um, at the Southern Foodways Alliance. Joe, um, like me, earned a master's degree in Southern Studies at the university. Joe, like me, came to study race relations. He wanted to do a film about the Freedom Riders. And all of a sudden, he's on the same truck I am, um, using food as a way of exploring our place. Um, I think there's much to explore in Arkansas. Um, I think Arkansas, like Mississippi, shares um, this not yet formed identity. Our food culture, though rich, has not been codified as well as perhaps Louisiana, even Alabama and Tennessee. So I think there's great opportunity here and the two films will show the first on Mississippi um, and the second um, that, uh, that, uh, that profiles Arkansans, um, I think are first steps in that work. I should also mention that just today, um, the Southern Foodways Alliance um, posted on our website, we, the oral histories we've done, which now number about 650 um, and 35 films in, in addition, um, we posted five new oral histories, all done in Arkansas with Arkansas Barbecue Pitmasters. Um, all those are available online, um, full transcripts of them. Um, and we also have developed an iPhone app as a finding aid as well for those of you who are iPhone equipped. Um, so in here, in these films, um, our attempt to pay homage to Mississippi and Arkansas to, um, you can hit it, I'll just keep babbling. Um, 
Um, two, to me, southern states that have yet to be explored and offer much richness. I'll step up um, between the two films to set up them. This one focuses on Jackson, Mississippi. Um, and if you think about this film, think about how this restaurant offers portals to think about a variety of different creative forms, whether it be music, um, to think about food ways, and then think about how you can get at social justice, what other um, activities took place in this restaurant, who gathered in this restaurant, um, how this figures into um, the musical heritage of Mississippi as well. And then I'll step back up between the two. Big Apple Inn, fourth generation. Well, we're just a little simple sandwich shop. That's all we make our sandwiches. The really unique sandwich we have in here is called a pig ear sandwich, and it's you know that's it's exactly what it is. It's a pig's ear, and um, <clears throat> we cut the ear you know into three pieces, so it'll fit perfectly on that same size bun, and put the same ingredients on it: mustard sauce, slaw, and hot sauce. And and you know pig ears are such a big hit. Three ears. What else for you, ma'am? I've been eating pig ear all my life. <laughs> That take me back from the country. See, I, I stay in Bowdoin. I done came all the way from Bowdoin to Jackson to get the pig ear sandwich. And remember, you have to get, you got to get a pair of ears. You can't buy just one. You got to get the set of ears. <laughs> this is a pig ear, and uh, it's not recommended for people who have diabetes. Pig ears. Oh, they so 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 good. I said those pig ears Think to hurt me calling me Oh, those pig ears so good Make you come back for some more Well, it's, uh, it's pork. It's, it's good and juicy. Y'all been trying me. Y'all listening now. Go down, go down on fast and get you one of them good pig ears and you'll come back again and again. Mmm. Pig ear sandwich. My name is Bobby Rush. I'm better known as Sue's boyfriend. I'm here in Jackson, Mississippi on Faraday Street at Big Apples, one of the oldest places to eat that's still operating on Faraday Street. If you want something to eat, come down on this street. Right here in Big Apple, you know they can fill you up with something to eat, pig ears and all, huh? Pig ears and all. They're the one, they the one, they knows how to, how to, how to burn. Now, when you sum up the bread, the wrapping, the sauce, the slaw, when you mix it all together, it says good. <laughs> good stuff. That's why they stay so long, because not only is it it's an economical sandwich, it's a good sandwich. As of this, this year, we've been open 70 years. Right now, they're 105. A lot of people say, wow, that's a long way from a dime. But when you, you, when you add it up, that's still less than a dime a decade. So uh, you might as well say we go up pretty much a penny a year. That's still not bad. <laughs> We're still beating inflation. When I was a kid, we used to come down here, and they was 25 cents. And I used to like the pig ears because my hand are sticking. And I used to like putting them on my sister when I get to eat. <laughs> she didn't like my sticky hand. <laughs> And they was 25 cents then, and they used to give them to us for Halloween. Every Halloween, if you come around Big John when I was small, they would give you a, 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 a they, they would give you a smoke sandwich. A smoke sandwich or a pig ear when I was little, and for trick or treat. And uh, as a matter of fact, I tried coming twice, but they seen the same costume too many times. <laughs> Yeah. 
in the early, well, I guess mid 1930s, my great grandfather pushed a hot tamale cart up and down Ferry Street. He was an old Mexican man. His name was Juan Mora. Um, never, never legal here. Jumped off the train when he got to Mississippi. Of course, couldn't make enough money, so he realized that, listen, I have a great little recipe for hot tamales that my mother makes back home from Mexico City. So he started making hot tamales and selling them on the corner of Hamilton and Ferry Streets and out of a tin drum and an open fire. Got enough money and built a cart and pushed a hot tamale cart up and down Ferry Street and sold tamales out of the cart. In 1939, an opportunity came for he and his son, Harold, to open up a, um, a restaurant here on Ferry Street. It was actually a grocery store at the time and the guy wanted to sell it for $100. And my grandfather and my great-grandfather came up with 50 and borrowed another 50 and opened up the Big Apple Inn. My grandfather at the time said that during, the 19, during 1939, his favorite dance was called the Big Apple. So he named it after his favorite dance, the Big Apple, and he called it the Big Apple Inn. Tonight, Baron Skinner has a little treat in store for you. The Big Apple Contest. Now we've always been incorporated under the name Big Apple Inn, but everybody always called the name Big John's from my great grandfather. Let's go to Big John's place, and it's still called Big John's. My grandfather had opened the business and was selling the three or four items that uh, were already on the menu from the previous owner. And one day, a store owner next door, a meat market guy, came by and asked John, said, John, I have some pig ears. Uh, could you use them? Well, my grandfather never turned away anything that was given to him, so he said, yes, I can use them. He didn't know exactly what to do or how to, how to cook it. He tried deep frying them, didn't get them tender enough. Tried, you know, put them on the grill, didn't get it tender enough. Tried, I mean, all kinds of ways to cook them. Found out that if you boil them for two days, they'll get tender enough to put on a sandwich and eat. So he started selling pig ears like that, and then later on he started pressure cooking them, and it only takes two hours now to get them tender enough to eat. This is about the size of an ear. One ear will make three sandwiches. And you just cut it up into threes, and then you cook them up. Each box will make about 300 sandwiches. And we go through an average of two boxes a day. On busy days, we go through about three boxes a day of pig ears. The people who are indigenous to the South, especially the Jackson area, wonder, you know, what's the big deal about a pig ear? You know, we, they used to eat in the country. You know, they used to eat in the, you know, but right now, I guess people think of pig ears as, you know, you go get it at the, at, at the pet store and give it to your dog, you know, <laughs> which is, which by the way, um, is something we really hate because we used to buy our pig ears for $13 for a 30 pound box until they started making it for dog chews and now we pay $59 a box for that same, <laughs> for that same case of pig ears. You know, pig ears are great, but I just think the mild smokes are, you know, just the ones to have. Big John smokes, y'all. You can get them hot, extra hot. Oh, when you get them extra hot, you know they hit the spot. You either hear this, you either hear, let me have two smokies, or you hear people say two smokes, or they'll say two hots. Now, hots gets a little confusing, because they'll say, that, let me get two hot smile. <laughs> you know, so that's a little confusing, but yeah, we have them, they call them one of those three things. What it is is Red Rose Smoked Sausage, and Red Rose Smoked Sausage is made here in Mississippi. It's the only place it can be bought, and they don't even ship out of the state of Mississippi. What we do is we grind it up um, to the consistency of, I guess, like ground beef, put it on a griddle, put it on a crystal-sized bun with a mustard sauce, slaw, and our homemade hot sauce, and it makes a great sandwich. The most popular order is just when you just, just, just split it in half, you know, let me get three smokes and three pig ears, or two smokes, two pig ears, you know, but the pig ears are such a mainstay, and people just love the pig ears so much that you'll have some customers who just want one pig ear, but maybe five smokes, or maybe ten smokes in one pig ear. If ears happen to be cooking at that time, or if they're not ready, or if we happen to be out, they'll cancel the whole order, because they got to have that one pig ear. Three smokes, two ears. What else for you? 525. All right. Thank you. But I got uh, half and half. I got, well, just, just I just got six. I got three 
smokes and three pig ears, and when I'm eating, I alternate. You might see me reach in the bag, pull out one, and I put it back and grab another because I'm alternating the taste, <laughs> alternating the different flavors. If you want a hamburger, or if you want a hot dog, you know, go to, you know, go to McDonald's, you know, go to Burger King. If you want a pizza, you go to Pizza Hut or, you know, other places. But, if, you know, when you want to come here, you're coming down to get a smoke in an ear. The food they serve here is somewhat of a delicacy. You see, you don't find the kind of what we call hot smoke or pig ears everywhere. And if you do, they don't nearly compare to what we get here. Anybody who haven't had a smoke or a pig ear set that live in Jackson has missed something. They have. Ferris Street was the only place to go to town if you were black, you know, to have a good time. In fact, Ferris Street was known as Little Harlem. You know, the train station is two blocks over. When people would get off the train, they'd come straight to Ferris Street, and they say it was walking room only. I mean, you could not fit. There were shops and clothing stores and restaurants and juk joints and movie theaters, and everything down here was black-owned and black-run, and all the patronage was black folks. It's like Bill Street, Fabulous Street, Bill Street. It was the thing. Everybody walking, talking, whatever you want to find, if you had a taste for it, you could find it on Fabulous Street. The music was a big part of Ferris Street. We had music up and down the streets, live music in front of the restaurants. Many of the top-notch artists back in those days performed at the Crystal Palace. Now, the Crystal Palace was the place to go. That was, that was when any famous entertainer came to town. Red Fox performed there. Um, Sammy Davis Jr. performed there. Cab Calloway performed there. When anybody came to town, they performed at the Crystal Palace. And now it's a pleasure to present to you Cab Calloway. was a record recording studio down here, Trumpet Records, and they would do a lot or get a lot of the local entertainers down here. There were a lot of little local blues musicians who, who also came from this street. I don't know if you know about the um, famous harmonica player Sonny Boy Williamson, but um, when we first moved to our present location in 1952, the restaurant was downstairs, but above the restaurant was um, apartments, and Sonny Boy Williamson rent rented an apartment upstairs. And he would, you know, sleep all day and then perform his music at different clubs all night. And um, I don't really think he became super famous until after he died. In fact, um, my father used to tell me that Sonny Boy, when he was a kid, used to take him to the Pearl River and they'd go fishing. At the time, I didn't know of Sonny Boy's prominence in life. We knew that there was a musician that lived upstairs. He would come down and eat. And he said, I want to take you fishing with me. So we would go down on the riverbank and if I caught anything he took it off and put it in a little bucket for him. It wasn't until later that I found out this was one of the blues legends, Sonny Boy Williams. If you don't be mighty careful the devil gonna get you one day. <laughs> After a while, I guess the apartments really weren't making a lot of money, so the landlord of the building decided to turn it into office space. So um, they rented it out to, you know, attorneys and professional people. So above us, our office space went up there to Medgar Evers. That was his office when he was field secretary for the NAACP. And for a short time, I understand that Fannie Lou Hamer's office was up there too. And they worked together on a lot of things. Medgar's office was upstairs. 
uh, for two reasons. Number one is because there was a Baron probably we could find, and it, and it was safe for him. Medgar uh, didn't have the office space for the influx of people, and they would meet down here and uh, discuss their strategy. When people came down uh, to order sandwiches, they saw the crowds and uh, they inquired what was going on. So they joined in. In fact, uh, they would be lined up at the door just to hear Medgar and hear his strategy. And he always had encouraging things to tell them. So the Big Apple was a big part of uh, the strategy, not so much as implementing anything, but a place where they could meet and feel safe. So Ferris Street has, you know, I mean, was the place to be and the place to go. Now we come to, you know, 70 years later, Ferris Street's a ghost town. All the people are gone. All the crowd is gone. A lot of business is closed. A lot of building is gone. But, and this was one of the places that really uh, stood the test of the weather and the storm and it's still here. The food's still good. I came in this morning, I asked the young lady, was it good as the, was the food still good like it was? Those smokes were 30 years ago. She said, of course, yes. So, and I got me a few of them and they are, they are excellent. And uh, I really uh, uh, admire that family for keeping this tradition of going. My father and my grandfather view success as seeing people satisfied. And I think this has transcended over the years. I know we've instilled in our son, the one who's presently running the business, that uh, it's not the end, but it is a means to an end. Even though you won't be rich, but it's so satisfying to leave here every day knowing that you've done some good, knowing that uh, you've done the kinds of things that uh, my grandfather had set out to do, and that was to make sure nobody left you hungry. Uh, in fact, my father quoted uh, on one of our little calendars. He said, this is the place that made you glad that you were hungry. We are a fixture in this community. You know, when people come to Ferris Street, or a lot of times when people come to Jackson, they have to come to Big John's because this is home. You know, they have been raised on this. They've been eating this since they were, you know, one, two, three years old. When they come to town or when they come to Ferris Street, they have to come to Big John. As we talked about earlier, Ferris Street has been, in, has been on the decline, you know, pretty much since the late 60s, early 70s. You know, but we have stayed down here. It's definitely not because of the money. It's because of our dedication to Ferris Street. Been a long time. I've been eating me some Big John. Yes, it's been a long, long, long time, y'all. I've been eating those Big John. If you eat one, two, you know the cook knows just what to do. I want ten, I'm gonna take them home with me, give me ten, and two more for the eat, I'm gonna take these pot, eat them all up on the spot. Big John, Big Apple Inn on Ferris Street back in the 60s. Thank you all for giving me a bag to go. <laughs> okay. 
So that was Mississippi. Up next um, comes some Arkansans working the Mississippi River. Um, I mentioned in the setup of this film, I mean, think about it. This restaurant served as an incubator for the civil rights movement, for the music scene, and as an incubator of literal community um, in that place on that street in Jackson. Um, we gave Gino Lee, the proprietor, um, what is um, one of the two honors that Southern Poways Alliance bestows each year, this um, uh, Keeper of the Flame Award, this idea that, that he keeps alive something important. One of my proudest moments in working with the Southern Poways Alliance, and we've been around 14 years now, was stepping in the Big Apple Inn um, about two years ago, and there was a TV on the counter, and there was a DVD, one of those built-in DVD players, and Gino had that film playing in constant loop. So no matter when you showed up, that film was playing, and it was beautiful because that means people in the community got to see their place anew and got to see the import of that restaurant framed in a different way, and that's my job. Um, and it's the most important part of my job, I think, is to frame food for people, to challenge them to think about it in new ways. And that restaurant deserves that treatment. I think it's an important place. Um, and I thank you for watching. And now comes a film called Eggers. All these, again, made by Joe York, all these um, are, can be streamed at our website, which is southernfoodways.org. Um, and all of these, if, you, if you're an educator um, or an, uh, a public history person, all these are available, screeners of these are available free um, with no charges to screen, um, which I th we think is important. Yeah, I'm Lee Ross, and we're sitting here on the bank of the White River. We're getting ready to go down and uh, run some tie-down gill nets and try to catch some paddlefish. And I uh, hope we have a good day. I don't know exactly what it's going to be like. Every day is different. <laughs> That's for sure. We're on the Mississippi River right now. I'd say wrote maybe a little north of Rosedale, Mississippi. Uh, we're in the Mississippi River. Most people are terrified of this river. I mean, they won't even think about coming out here in a, in a boat like this and doing what we're doing. And, and if you don't know what you're doing, that's probably a good idea. I never in my wildest dream when I was little thought I'd be a caviar fisherman. I thought I might be a fisherman, but not a caviar fisherman. <laughs> you know, me and you here in Arkansas, we don't know anything about the demand for caviar, but in Hollywood, it must be, must be a hell of a demand. I, I can't quite figure it out myself. You know, the, the caviar, there's not a lot of caviar out there anymore. And they gotta, they gotta kinda have something to replace it with. This, that's what made the paddlefish all of a sudden worth so much, you know? It pretty much replaced it. A lot of those caviars. No! Quit doing all that backing up and shit, Billy Ray. Just put this so much in neutral for a minute. Yes, uh, my name's Billy Manners, and uh, I'm Lee's helper out here on the river out here on his phone bill. We run the net together. And he does all the pulling all the fish out and stuff, and I just keep the motor going. I know it's dangerous, but I like it. My, I've been dangerous my whole life, been dangerous. So it goes with me. There's one. Pretty good size one. That's got eggs there. There's your eggy one right there. Oh, look how big his belly is. 
See that belly? See that belly? He's full of eggs. Paddlefish, that's their real name. They don't have a family or nothing, you know, like that there's not any they're not kin to any other fish. They're they're a fish of their own, you know. Real old fish too. They're in all your river major rivers and all your big lakes. A lot of people don't know it though because they don't you don't catch them on fishing poles, you know, they won't they won't bite a hook or nothing like that. You know, back ten years ago, paddlefish the fishermen was getting like twenty-five dollars a pound. Thought of them as a thought of them as a trash fish, pretty much. They're in my net, and I don't want them. You know, you can imagine picking them out all day long when you was trying to catch catfish. Now you, it's like you got a piece of gold. You know. Pretty hard, you wanna feel it? It's, it's pretty stiff. Yeah. Yeah. Take it off, you could cut it off here and take it home and use it, you know, to whip your kids. Something like that, they got out of line on you. Something going on, spoon bill. Look like a big one. Look like it. Maybe. Oh yeah, maybe. I don't know, no, maybe not. Can't tell. Don't look like it, does it? I don't. I don't think this one's got no eggs. But I'm gonna poke him. You can watch it. No eggs. So you just throw him right back in. He's good to go. If they don't have eggs, throw them back. They may have eggs next year. I mean, this fish right here is not legal, but you might can make ten dollars off of him as meat, or you might can make four hundred dollars next year with caviar. So. Pull that lead line in to you. See if you see anything in that net. We're gonna blow into the freaking bank. Whew! The sucker has got some pressure on it. Get in here. That's a big. That's a big fish. Monster fish. You don't catch a lot of them like that. We call them eggers. Egger. That's an egger. There may be 10 pounds in there. Ooh. That's a big one. That's a strong fish too. We cut their tongue. We cut it to get all the blood out of them. Then we get ready to cut the eggs out. The eggs will be a lot better quality because they won't have any blood in them. Blood will ruin the eggs. You know, it, it probably wouldn't hurt you, but it just, it, it, it gives it a, it's just like catfish. When, you, when we harvest catfish, we bleed them. Blood in catfish fillets make it taste muddy. That's where the muddy taste comes from, that everybody says the muddy water, it's actually blood. Exactly right, the blood vein. Get ready to take these eggs out of this fish. We cut those eggs out just like that. We take those eggs and dip them in the river a couple times. And we make sure they're good and clean, get all the blood off of them. And that's one side, that's one row. That's what you call a row. No telling how many eggs are in that row. And we drop them down in that bag and put them down in this ice water and they'll be good to go then. Probably $400 right there. We probably got $800 worth of row in the boat right now. So most of it goes to uh, LA, Hollywood and that area. Yeah, somebody's got to do it because uh, the, the, them guys in California sure aren't going to do it. <laughs> so what's lunch? Buy any sausage. You ever eat caviar for lunch out here? No. I don't eat caviar, period, to be honest with you. <laughs> I mean, you know, I would much rather have some fried catfish or dead gum steak or even vines for that matter.
You ever eaten the caviar? No. Never tasted of it. Why not? Because I don't want to. But it come out of the inside of a fish. You don't like fish livers? No. My brother Donald does, though. So I was sitting with nice people on the front row um, who had squeamish reactions to, um, to the belly being slid open um, and also to the pig ears. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, this idea of thinking about where your food comes from extends to all facets of food. Um, you know, pig ear is um, a seemingly indelicate food, but as those of you, um, the culinary students here know, and those of you who eat widely and well know, that that's one of the hippest, most modern foods of the moment, or um, pig ears cut into slivers and stir-fried. Um, you know, that's a au courant food. Um, and certainly caviar, um, you know, as served um, in grand restaurants throughout the nation. But it begins with that chop of the cleaver or the plunge of that syringe in the belly of a, of a fish. And it begins with working class folk doing um, that labor. And, and I think it's important to make those connections um, and to do it in a playful way. There's, there's playfulness certainly in all of this. Um, but you know, I think it's important and I certainly care about using food as a way of thinking about all those issues. I and mean, this, this last film is maybe a meditation on class and labor um, the previous film on race and, and creativity um, and I'm glad to have had an opportunity to share those with y'all tonight. Um, I'll be happy to take a couple of questions if that's what I'm supposed to do. Is that what yes. I'm supposed to do? Uh, we do have time for some questions. If you raise your hand we'll get a microphone to you. Yes ma'am. Yes ma'am. I noticed on the, um, the Mississippi film that the award that was given was uh, Ruth Fertel. Yes. From Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. She Indeed, who was here that. just um, in November. Yeah. yeah, I yeah. saw the sun, but um, she started that award, or is that award in her, named in her honor? It was, it was um, named in her honor. Her son, Randy Fertel, who was here um, with his book, The Gorilla Man and the Empress of Steak. Um, Randy runs two different foundations in New Orleans, um, the Ruth U. Fertel Foundation and then the Fertel Foundation. And we began our film program with, um, with a gift from Randy um, that really catalyzed the film program uh, almost 10 years ago now. Um, and they continue to fund filmmaking um, with the Southern Foodways Alliance. So that, that was named in honor of her with the idea that this award goes to a working class cook or restaurateur or farmer or artisan um, who should you know, be put on the same pedestal as a fine dining chef, but whose name we don't know and should know. And Gino Lee was an example of that. Thanks for the question. Yes, ma'am. One second. Can we get? Yeah. Thanks. Once those uh, eggs are harvested, what happens to the rest of the paddlefish? I don't know what they do with them. Paddlefish is, is I don't know, are there any chefs in here who can answer if paddlefish is good cooking to eat in fish? I would, it eats like catfish? Yeah, it makes, it makes sense. I don't know what these guys do with them. I would and we can, I can ask Joe that, I should know. Um, I would imagine they cook them for dinner. Um, you know, this is not a, you know, as you can tell, they value that as a, as, as, they value that in economic terms. I would imagine it's a good way to feed your family. If it eats like catfish, imagine it would eat pretty well, but I don't know. Yes, Kevin. Hey, John. Hey. <laughs> um, well, I was looking through your book uh, just now, um, the Trump book, 
And uh, this is one of the books I don't have um, by you, um, that haven't been signed by you either. Anyway, um, so there's a section where you talk about fusion cuisine and how it's gotten a bad rap and how it's certainly, de certainly deserves some of that bad rap every now right. and then. But I, and so that got me thinking about some of the stories that, you were, that, um, that the SFA tells about um, the, the diaspora of the South, whether it be new immigrants coming in or mm -hmm. whether it be uh, Southerners moving to Chicago or, right. or you know, through the Great Migration. I was wondering if you could start to talk about fusion cuisine in, in that sort of osmotic term of, of, of diasporic cuisine, which is, of course, now very au courant. But, it is. But that has been going on here in the South for generations. Yeah, th there's long been exchange that has defined the South. I mean, you know, people, you know, it's been traditional to define the South as a land of black and white. And the tensions in the South and, and the great glories of the South have been determined and defined in terms of West Africans and Western Europeans. Um, but the reality is, um, take, um, take the story of the Big Apple Inn. You know, Gino's grandfather, um, a Mexican man who immigrated to Mississippi, um, and who sold tamales, um, which we don't we think of as a recent arrival to the South, tamales. But in the Mississippi Delta and in the Arkansas Delta, um, those are foods, those are early fusion foods um, that when bumper cotton harvest came in in the late 1800s and early 1900s, um, laborers were brought in via train to work cotton harvests. And a remnant of those Mexican laborers who came from Texas um, and came from Mexico itself, a remnant of their time in the South are tamales, and now tamales, um, you know, they are creolized in the lower case sense of the word because the people making them over time, um, the, the Mexican laborers return to Mexico, but the people who take up that trade in many cases are African American laborers. Um, they are in the Mississippi Delta, quite a few Sicilians, um, and you see especially in the Mississippi Delta, and it may be the case here too, I know less about the Arkansas Delta, but you see tamales, instead of steamed, they're cooked in this kind of greasy tomato sauce um, that looks and, and tastes almost like a pasta sauce. You know, you, you get this kind of early fusion um, that's honest, and, and that's to me what's interesting about um, traditional cuisines is that they show the attributes of many cultures if you look closely, if you eat closely, you can see it, um, you can taste it. But we tend to dismiss fusion as, you know, some um, dishonest activity. You know, when, when you say fusion cuisine, you think about somebody who's trying to marry uneasily two cultures for a goof, for a marketing stunt. Um, but here are examples of um, fusion cuisine from the turn of the century, the turn of the last century in the South that are honest. And I, I'm fascinated by those because I think they tell an unexpected story of the South and help us realize the richness of this place and the contradictions of this place through food. Did I answer your question in any way? <laughs> <laughs> Time for uh, two quick more. Right there. Yep. John, a couple years good ago, we talked. Again. Yeah. Good to see you. We talked about Jones's barbecue, and you shared yeah. with me that it was one of the more difficult interviews you've ever done. <laughs> uh, I, I found in Arkansas that that's something that's either definitely on people's radar or not. In fact, right. I'm sitting with one of my best friends who's from Mariana, and I find that many people don't know of the place. With the recent James Beard Award they've received, I just wondered if you could share with the crowd a little bit about your experience at Jones's. Sure. How many people know Jones Barbecue in Mariana? Not enough of y'all. Wow. Okay, so tomorrow, <laughs> drive to Mariana um, and get there early. Take the day off. It's going to be nice again tomorrow. Get there early. They'll be serving barbecue by 930 probably. Um, so you could maybe even get back to your place of work by lunch with a bag full for your friends. So Jones, I was fascinated with Jones. I heard about Jones Barbecue in Mariana from Rex Nelson. Um, I mentioned those oral histories that we just put online um, to document Arkansas um, barbecue. Rex wrote the introduction to those oral histories that just went online, and Rex has been a, a sage and an advisor to me through the years. Um, and Rex told me about Jones, and he said, you've got to go try this place. And I went, and Mr. Jones um, 
was a reluctant interviewer when I asked him about kind of family history. He told me there was, there was somebody had written a family history, but it was in Chicago. We talked about migration to north, and somebody took it to Chicago, and I said, well, is there any way we can get it back? Um, no. Um, you know, I asked him, you know, have people written about this place before? And he told me it was on the internet. Um, and um, I didn't take offense at any of this. Like, you know, if you, if you think about someone like, like Mr. Jones, um, he's been running, his family's been running that business since third generation now, um, since at least 1910. Um, since at least 1910. And who am I to show up and ask questions about his place? If you want to know about that place, then you grew up in that community and you learn about it that way. You know, for me to ask those questions and for Mr. Jones not to know me, you know, my activity is extractive in a way. You know, I'm taking something that is his, his story, extracting it from him, telling that story and making money. So I, I, I don't, he was a quite difficult subject and I ended up writing something that was, if this was an Oxford American piece that um, about kind of that process and about thinking through what it was like to be not a native of Mariana, to be a white kid from Mississippi asking this, um, this distinguished and aged African American man about his business and whether he should be telling me any damn thing. Um, so uh, I wrote about that and I was proud of that piece, um, but I feel like the, the trumpeter in charge for Jones, I think beyond the fact that that place has been in business since 1910 and maybe, you know, if it's not the oldest um, family owned African American restaurant in the South, I don't know what is. Um, and if it's not one of the oldest African American owned restaurants in the country, I don't know what is. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful place, and the barbecue, you ever had Riettes? We were, I was talking to somebody today about Riettes, like, you know, this, this kind of pork cooked in its own fat um, until it's really, really creamy um, and takes on this really beautiful, thready texture. That's what his barbecue tastes like, but better. Um, with this beautiful vinegar kiss sauce, um, you know, on a piece of white bread handled, handed to you in a fumple, in a fumpled, in a crumpled tin pouch, um, tin oil pouch. It's beautiful, kind of, uh, this great ideal of barbecue, and it's right over there in Mariana, and you can get there tomorrow for lunch. They will, Mr. Jones and his family are going up um, to the James Beard Awards um, in a couple of weeks to receive the America's Classics Award. It will be the first Beard Award winner from Arkansas. Um, and uh, they'll step to the stage in front of about 2,000 people at Lincoln Center um, and accept that award on behalf of the state of Arkansas and on behalf of barbecue culture in Arkansas. And I'm really happy to see that. Last one. that the horchata that you mentioned earlier yeah. that I haven't been trying is in the food truck book, so it I'm going to try it. it <laughs> but I also just wanted to generally know what are some other exciting projects that you and the Alliance are working on right now? Sure. Um, the, um, the Southern Foodways Alliance is at work now on a, we've made 35 short films. You saw examples of two tonight. Um, the, um, what we're working on now is an hour-long documentary that will, um, we hope, we're at work on um, getting national distribution for and seem to be pretty close to that. So it'll show in all the PBS stations across the country. And it is um, kind of a survey, a census of modern American, modern Southern food in this moment. So it's not a look back at the history, it's a look at what's going on now. So much of the dialogue about food right now is punitive. It says, here's what's wrong. And it's, it's, you know, it's where people point their fingers at the industrial food system in America and say, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. And I think there's celebratory activist work to be done that says, this is right, this is good. This person's been working this five generations. Their traditions, their work should be valued and is valued. And that's what we attempt to do with these films is 
to pay homage to someone who's been doing this a long while, whose family's been at it, whose work matters. And it's not punitive. We don't attempt to be punitive. We don't attempt to say, here's what's wrong. We attempt to showcase, to shine a bright light on people like Gino Lee um, and say, here's what's right. Um, and I think there's much right. Um, I, I mentioned in my remarks that I have a conflicted sense of my region. I see many wrongs, I see many ills, but I see much that's good and just and honest. Um, and I think a lot of these people who carry on these food traditions um, carry on and showcase our better selves. So, so we'll be showing, a, we'll, be, we'll have an hour long film to, to answer your question. Sorry about that. Um, but we'll show this film that hopefully um, brings that perspective to life.